mail failure, the dot-com failure, the one we just had, and, and others. There's something quite similar about it. They're the, they're the freeway is blocked so you have to get home on the side streets. Because basically what happens is this highly efficient price system freezes. At which point resources have to be allocated another way. And Hayek would have told you the other way is vastly less efficient than the way we were doing. So the level of economic activity collapses to be consistent with this second choice distribution information network. But Network theory also shows you that, although they all fail, the failures all end. And so, network failures are things that are, other than in a, in a stochastic sense, they're unpredictable. <coughs> and they have no cause. You won't find, you know, when the power grid goes down in America, you won't, the newspapers will find a guy in Ohio that did. Right? They'll have some guy that flips some switch at the wrong time. But the uh, network, the network theory would tell you that that's bullshit. <coughs> that it's the structure of the network that caused the failure. And we call them blackouts. But black, blackouts end also. And you're always just as surprised when a blackout ends as when, when it happened. And in the meantime, our, our brains, conditioned by long experience, are looking for causes because if we can identify causes, we can protect ourselves. And those causes lead to policies. And those policies permanently change the system. Uh, healthcare, last week, is one of those. Financial reform is another one. Deep in the financial reform package Dodd's released, the president will, be, will appoint the chairman of the Fed, the vice chairman of the Fed, and the president of the New York Fed. Three of the members of the Yoga Market Committee. They've already put two guys on the board that are total captives of the politicals. I'm, I'm not talking Democrat or Republican, I'm talking about political control of an organization. Feds increased bank reserves by 1,200% in the last 18 months. There's pressure on them. They bought a trillion two of mortgage securities. Uh, if they don't unwind that, any book in the world will tell you bad things are going to happen. Uh, I believe that they don't have the political strength to do that. And so when you're forecasting the future, it's these pressures on these guys that interest me. It's the, it's the crossover between the politics and the, and the economics and the, and the psychology. Um, neural networks we talked about. If you want to look at this uh, system failure stuff, the single best starting point for me is uh, Barabasi's work. He's a Santa Fe Institute guy. Uh, he talks about system failures, uh, but he talks about it from a from a graph theory point of view. Uh, another one is there's a bunch of guys that started out of uh, Cornell, Watts and Strogatz and those guys, and they talk about it in terms of electricity grids and cascading failures and things like that. But I think for our purposes, all we have to know is that networks fail, cascading failures is how they fail, they're always temporary, and the size of them is driven by this power law distribution. And usually they're not very big, but every once in a while they're just mothers. I mean, they, like the one we just, we just lived through. And the only thing you can do about it is to design the architecture to make the probability of failures lower and the, and the probable depth of the failures shallower. So what would you do? You know, one thing I actually pushed for a little while and gave up pushing is if you took the Federal Reserve and sliced it into 12 independent Federal Reserves, and, uh, or if you took bank examining, which come, rolls, runs out of the control of the currencies office in Washington, and you delegated that to 12 district banks to do whatever they thought best but don't talk to each other, you would have a more robust network because of that, because you'd be changing the distribution of these node connections. You would get rid of, you would shrink the super nodes. The financial theory Part of what they're trying to do now is do that. This too big to fail stuff is basically trying to say we're trying to we want to eliminate highly connected agents, and I don't see anything in what they've written that'll accomplish that. But that's uh, that's the that's at least the math behind it. There's tons of stuff on the biology side you can trace to the same exact set of words we've been using, uh, ant colony studies and, and uh, ecosystem critical states. Uh, and you know Howard Odom would be the name there. Latka would be a name. 
early on on system on the mathematics of system theory from a biological standpoint, but it's a, it's a very similar thing. An interesting thing to me in this literature is there's a thing um, there's a thing called the Savonarola effect. Savonarola effect says these systems actually change over time, and when they change, they basically leave a trail behind them of history. So an institutional guy or a historian would say, yeah, that's why we need to study history. When you shock a system, it doesn't just move, it retreats along the same historical path it, it got there on. So when you look at shocks like we have now, or you could propose shock, what, ha what would happen if a big shock happened in China? That gives you a sense of trying to figure out what, what that regression might, might, actually, uh, might actually look like. Um, like we talked about structured networks. That's actually the structure of the U.S. financial system, done by the New York Times, of who's bailing out whom. <laughs> and what you find out is there are three super nodes, Treasury Secretary, Fed, and the SEC Chairman. And basically it all devolves from there. So creating tighter regulations driven from those same three guys and heightening the super nodes actually makes the system more fragile than it was if that can be distributed out there where uh, where essentially you have, you have the central limit theorem helping you. This world that blew up this way um, in the last couple of years has completely changed the minds of investors. Because investors were sold a bill of goods that says we can diversify your portfolio, control your risk, measure your standard deviation, and uh, protect your wealth. And it's all, it's all driven by historical correlation coefficients. And the fact is, I think I got a picture of him here. You don't want to know that. The fact is, um, so we got an optimal portfolio, and we're either and we got risk-free rate, and we have the optimal thing, and then we're going to own the market, or the risk-free thing in some combination. That's sort of the Tobin Markowitz version. If you then push past it into the, you know, call it factor, the, the multiple factor approach, which is basically the same thing with more stuff on the right hand side. Um, with no logic that I can detect about why those three things ought to be there. Uh, but you end up with the same thing. You end up with a view that says people ought to all do the same thing, with a little bit of room for your utility function in there. That you should never engage in corner solutions. You should never hold all cash. Uh, you should never take an active role in, a, in an investment and so forth. And I think those are the illusions that have been essentially uh, destroyed because this system failure I'm talking about. If you took it, if you took the credit market story, and you said <coughs> system failure is really non-price rationing of credit, <coughs> I've lived through a few of those as an owner of businesses, and basically, what happens is the regulatory authorities descend on the banks and alter their risk rating systems and their behavior, and they all shut off at the same time. And if you take that story, what it says is there's actually a black market happening. And there is a shadow price that would clear that market, which is way up there, but that price doesn't appear in any newspaper. So all the while the Fed's lowering the Fed funds rate, credit's actually getting more scarce and more expensive, which if you were a mezzanine lender or a private equity guy, is your dream come true. Because everybody needs cash, you've got it, you can charge 30% for what essentially is a secured loan. And that happens about once every 10 years in the last 40 years, and it lasts for two, three years, and you make a lot of money while that's, while that's happening. That kind of view of the world, <clears throat> if you put it back in that portfolio framework, says from time to time this risk-free rate moves up there, <laughs> at which point it is indeed optimal to have a corner solution. <laughs> if you knew that was going to happen, you don't know it's going to happen, but you know a probability distribution that it might happen, at which point you would be talking your way up in the middle someplace, but then you'd be saying, hey, wait a minute. People out there are actually advised to own portfolios that are 60 70% equities, 0 to 10% cash, and a little bit of bonds. That's basically what asset allocation boils down to in the real world as it's practiced. Why? Because the risk-free rate has zero correlation with anything but a, but a crappy yield. And you can beat that by combining equities with stable correlations into portfolios with better yields for just a little bit of risk. Um, worse is when these credit system failures happen, since people were allocated away from cash, it forces people into forced selling situations. 
where you also have a family business, the family business got shut down by the bank, you have to sell something out of your portfolio to put equity in the business to keep the real source of your wealth afloat, or your house payment or 